Okay, so for anyone who is joining, we're going to wait another minute because it looks like it's, it's we're a minute before four and then we will get started. Um, I see the participant numbers increasing. So when they stop increasing rapidly, then we'll get going. Those of you just joining, we are going to be starting in about a minute. I'm just going to wait for the participant numbers to stop climbing so rapidly, and then we'll get started. Okay, so um, I'd like to get started. So welcome to our webinar. Um, I'm Kimberly Clausing. I'm an economics professor here at the college and an avid follower of elections. I've been at Reed since the fall 1996 election. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here with my esteemed co-panelists at this event today. This is a very important election. I know we all wanna to get to the substance, but let me first just say a few preliminaries. First, I'd like to thank Mandy, who's done, Mandy Heaton, who's done extraordinary heroic work putting this together. And I'd also like to thank Kevin Myers. I was just mentioning as we were waiting for this to start that he wrote a, a new novel that's called Hidden Falls. That's a perfect distraction if anyone's looking to get away from the election over the next week. Um, second, a reminder to everybody uh, listening that while Reed is hosting this event, the views expressed, including most especially my own, are those of just the speakers and not the views of the college. Reed does not take any stance regarding candidates or political parties or political views. And the purpose of this event is just to simply bring people together to talk about this really important time in American history. Um, so let me just start by saying a few words about each of our panelists, and then we'll uh, get into it. Uh, we're very lucky to be joined by Congresswoman Del Benny. She is a Reed graduate. She was a biology major here at Reed, so that's how um, we like to think of her. Um, but she's also served in the Congress now for eight years, I believe. Um, and as it happens, she sits on the Ways and Means Committee, and I first had the pleasure of meeting her when I testified before the committee. And I was surprised at the moment when she pointed out to a packed hearing room that we were both Reed affiliated. So we got to really enjoy that moment. Um, at, at present, the Congresswoman represents Washington's first district with great distinction, and she's held a number of important posts in the business community um, and the tech industry before that. Uh, our second panelist is Paul Gronke. He is a very accomplished political scientist, and he knows more about early voting than just about anybody in the world. He's established an early voting information center at Reed with the mission of helping finding common sense nonpartisan solutions to increase the ability of every American to vote. And as a consequence of all of this important work, every four years, Paul becomes extremely busy this time of year. So we're very grateful he could break away to join the panel. And also from the political science department, it's my um, pleasure to introduce Chris Kosky, who teaches in our environmental studies program and in political science. And he has a deep knowledge of political processes, policy design, and especially environmental policy. And I will say on a personal note that it's probably the highlight of my entire teaching career this semester to teach a special course with Chris um, that is called the Economics and Politics of the 2020 Election. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, so as moderator, I have made a list of questions and I'd like everyone to know that I developed these um, based on the feedback that we received from students and faculty and staff. Um, but I thought a good place to start would be just to ask every one of you in the order in which you were introduced um, to reflect on why this election is so important. I know there are about a hundred things that leap to mind myself when I think about why this election is so important, but maybe each of you could focus on one or two things that you think are really makes this a historically important election. So Congresswoman, let's, let's start with you. Um, well, I'm with you. I, there are a lot of things we could talk about, but I think it's really about what standing up for our values and our democracy, uh, the, our values of 
equality and inclusion, um, making sure that you know every voice can be heard. Um, vote when we talk about democracy, just basic voting rights, um, the belief in in science and data, um, and making sure that that's driving our process, that we have representation, um, co-equal branches of government, um, a lot of things that have been tested, especially during this administration, some things that have been um, challenged before this administration, but definitely um, challenged even more now. Um, so it's great to see that people are out voting um, and realize the importance of their vote and the, that's their voice, but it is, um, there's so much at stake right now. We're so divided and polarized. If we're gonna come together, it's gonna be because people's voices are heard and they feel like their voices were heard um, through the election process. Thanks. Uh, Paul, you wanna take a stab at that? Sure, uh, you know, I've answered a variant of this question a number of times, not normally with Susan stealing my thunder. So thank you, Susan. Um, you know, I think it's the most important election since 1864. And I've thought of that number a bunch of times, like really that long? I think that's right. And I think um, echoing a bit what um, Susan has said, I think democracy is on trial this year. Um, I mean, it's, the, you know, my, my, my memory goes back to the 72 election. I remember a bit of the 68 election and, and there certainly have been highly competitive elections. Um, you know, we could go back perhaps to the 32 election with FDR against Hoover, but really in 1864, that was Abraham Lincoln running against General George McClellan and McClellan's campaign was essentially the maintenance of white supremacy and slavery in the South and really democracy was on trial um, in that election. And I think democracy has been on trial in this election as well. The foundations of our democratic system have been uh, repeatedly called into question. Um, you know, we have um, political strategies which are relying on voter suppression and on calling into question the legitimacy of our democratic processes. And so, you know, there are many other reasons that we could talk about, Kim, about, you know, turnout here is very likely going to be as high as we saw in 1960 as before. A number of very important issues are, are being debated, climate change, other things, Chris may speak to that, but really from my perspective, democracy is on trial this election and, and we've got to make it through um, or we're going to be facing a very, you know, problematic future. Chris. Uh, so obviously I agree with uh, both of my fellow panelists here, and I'm blessing I also agree with you, Kim, on, these, on the extraordinary nature of, the, of democracy being on trial. I think Americans are facing a series of existential threats that are quite real and getting more proximate. Um, one of them, of course, is climate change, and that's something we'll talk about later. But the other is right around the corner, right next door, it's COVID-19. And that's something that in and of itself maybe happens to be a part of the election, but ultimately is an issue that we're facing. But from the historical perspective, I think we are, we are having this conversation that we don't typically do in American politics. Rather than talking about substantive policy areas, we tend to be, we are talking now about institutions. I, I hear a lot of discussion about how we're going to change the courts, how we might actually add a couple of states, how we might even increase the size of the house. These are all issues that we tend to not have discussions about in typical election years. And this year we're having those kinds of discussions. It seems like whether the Democrats or the Republicans win, it, we're going to have a, a broader conversation about American institutions. If the Democrats win, it's likely that we're going to see at least a push, a part of the agenda of the Biden administration to try to fundamentally alter how it is that we, how it is that we vote, the kinds of power that different institutions have. Um, but the other issue you mentioned, I can have two. So the other issue I think is uh, really, I mean, like a, a sort of an historic moment here is that the United States over time, of course, has seen the rise in the power of baby boomers in both driving uh, public policy as well as driving political participation. And certainly it is true that baby boomers are still an important feature of the electorate, but this is the year where millennials begin to overtake baby boomers. As a Generation Xer, of course, I'm just sort of forgotten in most of this conversation, as, as are you, Kim, but- Always. <laughs> always, we're always- All forgotten. graphs exclude right. your generation. Yeah. yeah, the only graph that I actually saw in Exxon was the one that showed the millennials overtaking the boomers. But um, <laughs> what, what that means is that we, we're starting to see what the sort of the handoff between one generation, which was activists, of course, during the 60s, to another generation, which is quite activist now. And so that's one of the reasons why this is one of the most important elections of our lifetime, because we are, we are going to see what the new generation can bring. 
these are all great answers and I agree with all of you. And I'm gonna take my moderator's prerogative and insert my own answer in here too. Um, in addition to democracy, which I think is obviously bigger than almost anything. Uh, one of the things that I've really been motivated by um, over the last few years is thinking about the sort of risk we have to our economic model too. We've, we've really had four decades where economic growth hasn't really helped ordinary people to the extent that it did in the decades prior. And this income inequality was met by the Trump administration with a mixture of sort of blame and divisiveness. You blame people who don't look like you, you blame foreigners, you blame immigrants, you blame trading partners. The blame is always on someone else other than him. And so I think one of the really important things about this election is that we need to sort of reject the economics of blame, right? And look at ways to more effectively deal with inequality Quality. And I think that one of the, the really tragic things about the Trump administration is why he was blaming other people, he was actually making the inequality problem worse. So I think getting to the roots of, of practical solutions like a progressive tax system and an adequate safety net will require somebody other than Trump in the White House. Um, so that's my answer to that too, but mostly I will be asking you all, you all questions. Um, so let's turn next um, to sort of the PTSD we might feel from the 2016 election outcome. I know many of us still feel some sort of shock and grief associated with that. And I'd like to go next to Paul and, and ask him this question that I know is on a lot of people's minds. So, Will this happen again? <laughs> I hear a lot of people saying, is this going to happen again? Uh, will the polls be wrong? Uh, what have we learned so far from the early voting results? Um, and, you know, should we feel more positive this time around? Well, I recall, Kim, um, quite distinctly being uh, a guest at uh, an event that you offer every four years. Uh, my <laughs> colleague, Chris, was at this event as well. Um, and so he'll testify to the accuracy of this story. But one of our colleagues came over and, and asked me and said, so Paul, what is the path? Tell me the path. And I pointed to Pennsylvania and drew a little arc. And I said, that's, I think, going to be the path. And the, that, wait, that's not what I meant. People started tearing up about 15 minutes later. Chris and I started computing. So um, I don't think I, I was shocked. I, it was not what I expected in 2016. I wouldn't say I felt a sense of grief. It's, it, grief, it's time to adapt. Um, but that's perhaps the empiricist in me. Um, will it happen again? Um, well, one thing I will say is that the polling, uh, the folks that do the forecasting, the polling learned an important lesson in 2016. There's a great report that was issued by APOR, A-A-P-O-R, um, that explains what happened in 2016. What happened is that there was insufficient survey weighting for non-college educated white voters. And that was enough in some key Midwestern states to push to, to those, those polls were off. Um, and that's sufficient given those states. So those adjustments have been made. I'm, I'm confident that um, the folks that do the polls, um, they're, they're not gonna rely on a small number of polls in these states. Um, and they've made those adaptations. Um, you know, can it happen again? Yeah, of course it can happen again. Donald Trump is clearly a talented politician, a talented campaigner, um, and he has a very dedicated and fervent following. Um, we're seeing right now the numbers for the early voting um, are, are trending toward Democrat. We could talk about those, why more Democrats are casting ballots now. Um, so I, you know, I've done a number of interviews, as you can imagine, and more coming. And my typical line that I'm giving on those interviews is if, if, you know, if I'm um, Tom Tillis in North Carolina, if I'm Joni Ernst in Iowa, I'm worried because I'm really going to have to crank it up on Election Day. I'm going to have to get that vote out on Election Day. Um, and that's not normally been um, the Republican mobilization strategy. They've normally done very well with um, by mail voting. Now, uh, oddly enough, Trump's rhetoric seems to be dissuading his own voters um, from casting mail ballots. And so it's, it may be elderly Republicans in Florida that are standing in line um, on election day, not what we've normally seen. So, but yes, it can happen again. Um, the fundamentals are all pointing toward uh, advantages for Biden um, in many ways and everything's sort of lining up. Again, I'm trying to think 84, but we knew for a long time that Reagan was gonna do well. I don't, you know, 76, but that was post Watergate. Uh, you know, I don't know, things are really lining up uh, and it's looking very good for Biden right now. So, but I said that in 2016, you remember. <laughs> yeah, I feel better about it this time though. Chris, is there anything that you would you would? Yeah, add I mean, that? obviously I would never challenge Paul's uh, uh, supremacy on early voting. I don't know as much as he does about it. Uh, it does feel, on the one hand, I was, as I was saying in class today with you, Kim, it feels like uh, most Democrats or people that I should say tried to predict uh, Clinton victory in 2016, who were confident in the 2016 Clinton victory, 
those people now are scared to even utter the, the whiff of a, Biden, a potential Biden victory. At the same time, of course, they can't seem to imagine a Trump victory either. And so we're kind of living in this sort of state of, of uh, kind of like just static, it's this status state, just sort of waiting for the election to get over, despite the fact, as Paul has said, lots of folks are voting right now and have continued to vote. And to the sort of mobilization strategy, it's kind of, it's, it's really odd. I mean, I've seen, I, I followed the, the president on Twitter because I want to know whether somebody is going to be hired or fired in the administration. And the president has been essentially telling people to make sure that they get out, they go vote. And of course, for the kinds of voters that he's trying to mobilize, these tend to be people that are happen to be at most risk for sort of lar large crowd or large events. So he's essentially asking, he's begging voters to come out and turn out in ways, as Paul has said, are not traditional. I would say a couple of things about this election that are kind of striking to me. The president um, uh, rightly gets criticized for his rhetoric on race because he does a he engages a number of uh, rhetorical strategies that are designed to, frankly, be racist or be supremacist. And yet, um, the president's numbers, at least with Hispanics and African Americans, particularly men, are, are going to be. I I think that they're going to be higher this election than they were in the previous election. I'm not sure if that's going to necessarily matter so much. And the, you know, it's hard not, it would be harder, particularly with black voters to be lower than the 2016 numbers. But still, it's, these are areas where um, if we were to see sort of a, a shift or kind of defense against a potential wave, it might be actually with these, these voters in particular, specifically Hispanics in Texas, Georgia, or, or Florida. And sort of the irony would be here is that the president could very well, uh, could very well lose the election, but, but it, because he in fact loses white voters rather than losing voters of color. Relative to expectations. Relative to expectations, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, sorry. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, it's all relative expectations. yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, so turning to you, uh, Congresswoman, um, I thought given your role in the tech industry, you might um, tell us a bit about the role of technology in all of this. Um, so uh, many people were concerned about the targeting of voters through disinformation in, in 2016. Um, do you think we've learned from that experience? Uh, and, and what do you see in general as the role of technology in framing you know, voters' opinions and, and, and whatnot? Well well, clearly, um, we still have a lot of different information going out there. So we knew it was happening and found out a lot more. Um, the public found out a lot more about what was happening um, really after the 2016 election. But I think we've seen it throughout now. Um, there is, uh, I think you'll see a lot of policy discussions on this. Some of the amplification of disinformation isn't um, people amplifying it, it's bots and other technologies um, amplifying. And so um, there's been some attempt to um, take over, take down those accounts that aren't actual people, um, but are accounts set up to just kind of continue to, um, to click basically um, and amplify a lot of information and get it out there. Um, so, uh, and that obviously has, you know, challenges on financial models and advertising if you got a bunch of people looking at stuff who aren't actually people. Um, I think that there will be a lot of conversation re regarding technology policy. Um, you've heard talk about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that was really put in place at the very beginning to, um, to uh, kind of make sure there wasn't clarity on what kind of internet service providers were back then. Um, they weren't traditional publishers or information, um, uh, people who gave out information, they were really more of a platform, but there's been a lot more blurring um, of the lines of, of what different organizations and companies do. And so I think you're gonna see a lot of focus on that going forward. I also think privacy is a huge issue. Um, a lot of people's personal information is used in ways they never expected, they never um, agreed to. Um, you've seen California take steps on, on consumer data privacy, um, another issue that I've been working on as well. We need to make sure that people um, are controlled their most personal information so that if they, they understand how it's used and gathered um, as opposed to end up kind of being targets of disinformation, um, even based on information they never thought they gave out. So um, there's a, a lot of work to do there. I think we're behind from a policy perspective on, on technology. Um, a part of it is because lawmakers haven't always been the most up to speed on technology, but also because a lot of policy 
and um, as professors will know that better, was built on the way the world worked, a, a different way the world worked. You on the tech side would understand it's based on physical goods and physical presence, not on digital products. Um, a, a lot of policies are didn't anticipate the type of innovation we've seen, and that also impacts, again, civil liberties, civil rights, um, and constitutional rights. And so we have to make sure we up those, update those in a digital world. Yeah, that sounds very important. Um, so Chris, I understand that states run elections, um, but do you have suggestions for reforms that should go into a future Voting Rights Act to make sure that our elections have more integrity? Um, and do you have worries about voting integrity in this election and what's being done to keep the election safe? I mean, uh, yeah, I think we're all a little bit concerned about voter integrity. I, I think and this is something I learned from Paul and also Rick Hassan when he came and gave a talk here a couple of years ago, it sort of changed the way that I think about this. There's kind of two challenges associated with voting. The one, of course, is the outright suppression or you know, maybe implicit suppression, but efforts essentially to try to stop people from voting. And then there's the other component, which is the kind of competence of the people that are administering elections in America. One of the great features of America, of course, is its diversity and heterogeneity, not just in people, but of course, institutions. And that means that we are a country that's really hard to hack, I guess, when it comes to elections. It also means, however, that elections can be dominated by you know, states and localities. Um, for the longest time, as you know, the Voting Rights Act was this sort of bulwark against particular parts of the country with histories of racism of trying to suppress the vote. Um, the Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder, which Paul knows better than most people, um, said, uh, began to, well, took away a or invalidated a component of the Voting Rights Act. And eventually, I think the Supreme Court will likely get, away, get rid of all of it. So when it comes to the, the sort of new voter protections, um, one thing we could do is advance, and Congresswoman Del Delbeni will know this, one thing we could probably do is try to advance HR 4 uh, in, a new, in a new Senate. I mean, this, our new House and new Senate under a Biden administration. And this would essentially update the parameters to, that are used to determine the, whether states and territories need to uh, seek approval for electoral processes. And importantly, for, particularly for certain states that had really tight elections in the last midterm and will have tight elections as they become swing states like Arizona uh, for swing states or tight elections for say local offices like say North Dakota, um, the HR4 would also include um, protections for Native American and Alaska Native voters. So I think, I mean, I have concerns about this from the sort of the outright suppression perspective. I think honestly, if it's a fair fight, uh, states like Georgia, Wisconsin, and even Texas are frankly within the grasp of, of the Democratic Party. Um, however, as it currently stands, it, it sort of not only throws into question the integrity of the results, but also whether or not the party that actually should win, uh, actually did win, should win. And I don't know, Congressman Delbeni, if you have if you have any other sort of uh, thoughts. I was just going to say HR four is the Voting Rights Advancement Act, yeah. um, right. and uh, which we recently renamed the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, I was born in Selma, Alabama, so um, John Lewis has always been a hero of mine, and um, and obviously did so much to um, fight for voting rights and civil rights, but. Um, but that's a, a critically important piece of legislation. Another one that's been important is the is HR1, which is the We the People Act, um, because we also have issues of redistricting um, and ethics and um, that also need to be addressed that weren't necessarily specifically covered under the Voting Rights Advancement Act, but um, I think also um, have an impact on making sure that people um, have access to the ballot. Yeah, one thing that's really come up a lot this year is the tr Trump campaign has really made an assault on, on vote by mail and uh, early voting and implied that, that that's going to be fraudulent. Um, Paul, I wonder how that fits with your work and what you've seen in your work and, and whether there are lessons from that work for what additions potentially to some of these bills on voting. Um, sometimes I don't turn on the TV or Twitter or mail in the morning so I can have a reasonable day. Uh, yeah, I've grown increasingly impatient with those questions, Kim. Not from you, of course, um, but from journalists because I'm getting sick and tired of fact-checking claims by the Attorney General of the United States, which I'm convinced that he knows are false. Um, I don't want to get detailed, but Chris already referred to this and anyone who looks at the field knows mm -hmm. there's a lot of details and nuances here. So the um, Multnomah County alone has 100 different ballot styles. What that means is that if Kim and I, we live within about, well, Chris and Kim and I all live within about a mile from one another, but I suspect we might be in different state Senate districts, House to state, House to, et cetera. It means we get a different ballot style, but we live in the same county. 
So the possibility for a foreign entity to counterfeit ballots for one county alone and then fake the, it's just so far beyond the reality and to have to fact check that every two or three weeks. Finally, I'm just like, look, let's disbar bar. Ha ha, that gets me on television, but it's true. I don't. So um, sure, I want to wind back to one thing um, and, you know, hold uh, the congresswoman's feet to the fire a little bit. You know, a lot of people, and I think rightfully so, criticize the current makeup of the Supreme Court. But um, there was a reason why Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act was um, gotten rid of, and that's because it was well out of date, and that's because Congress couldn't update it, and Congress could not get get together and update it. We really need that formula updated. Um, it wasn't really equitable to, for some localities to be held uh, to standards that were established 50 years ago. It needed to be updated, and Congress and the administrations kept kicking the ball down the road. So we need that done. The other thing is likely to happen, I suspect, all of HR1 might not pass, but I think they'll mandate no excuse absentee balloting for federal elections nationwide. That will probably push no excuse. We'll get down to, you know, um, I mean, we need to, we need to be no excuse after. If you're in Texas, you should not, if you're a 64 year old, you should not have to go to the polling place. And if you're a 65 year old, you get to vote no excuse. But what we know from vote by mail, sure, there's virtually no voting fraud in the United States. Um, we've been looked at many times in many states. Um, and, um, and so that's the lessons of my work. Folks like it, of its convenience. Um, they like drop boxes. Um, one campaign, you can guess which one, has been suing in multiple states to try to ban the use of drop boxes. I simply don't understand that one. I've tried to, I'm an academic. I can come up with arguments against anything. I can't come up with an argument against a drop box. They're more secure than the blue boxes, the postal boxes, okay? I mean, my God, I know what gauge steel they're made of, right? I mean, I, I, I know these crazy things because I've had to testify about them. So. Um, yeah, you know, vote by mail works really well. It's very resilient. If you have people who are displaced by forest fires, folks are like, well, what do you do? Well, if it's a polling place election, you've got one option, go to the county office. If it's a vote by mail system, you got three options. So um, it's worked very well. Sadly, I think, tragically, regrettably, I say, if I'm trying to be more balanced, um, we have a, a campaign. The strategy appears to be to sow distrust and um, lack of faith in our political system to set the stage for challenges on election night. We're already seeing that, and I, I hate to say this, we've got a Supreme Court Justice, Judge, Justice Kavanaugh, who said false things. I don't know whether he didn't know it or what, but he said things about that election results are finalized on election night. That's wrong. Um, yeah. And he said, gosh, some states haven't changed their election system in 2020. So all state, well, you know, we have 50 different elections. I'm sorry, I lose patience with this stuff. It's like, you yeah. are a Supreme Court Justice of the United States, and you're <laughs> saying things that are factually not true. I don't know what to do other than lose my patience. In Washington, state, we, in Washington state, we already have, um, you know, it's a postmark um, by election day, and it's been that way for a while. Um, I know that mm. issue came up in the case that- you care to, how yeah. many California are you gonna, what's your turnout gonna be, yeah. Susan? Because we put, we put a line in the sand, we're gonna hit 80%. Are you gonna I think it? the estimates right now um, from our Secretary of State are 85 to 90% turnout. Oh, I'll see about that. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, no fighting, no fighting. We've got a bet with yes. Colorado, and now we got Washington. I just, I want everybody voting, so um, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to have a competition on that. Yeah, so um, Congresswoman, um, moving past the vote, um, how worried are members of Congress about the transition? Um, if we assume, knocking wood in my case, that Biden wins, is it fair to assume a peaceful transition? One thing that people have really worried about is the failure of both Trump and Pence when asked directly this question to sort of reassure the public that they would commit to a peaceful transition. Is this something that members of Congress worry about too? And well, I think first people talk about making sure you win big um, because when you win <laughs> big, there's less yeah. um, areas for dispute uh, too. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I think has come up a lot, even this Congress not is, um, Will people stand up for our institutions? So, um, and and we haven't always seen that. It should be bipartisan for folks to stand up for uh, the kind of the basic tenets of our democracy. And you would expect that many Republicans would also say this is um, this is important. I'd stand up for that. Now, unfortunately, over the last four years, there are a lot of things that I thought many of my Republican colleagues would also stand up for and um, and haven't. Um, whether it's a, a tweet, um, you know, or, or kind of, well, 
so many, we can come up with, with so many examples. Um, campaigning on with a, using the, the, your official office, all of those things. I um, mean, we yeah. haven't heard that. So, um, so I do think that there's always, I think, you know, Paul talked about some of the concerns around challenges that will be made um, that could delay things. Um, there's even, you know, folks have looked at the various scenarios if things were challenged, what happens even if it went back to the House of Representatives. So I think people have walked down various scenarios but um, but I believe in the end that folks are going to stand up, especially as as if we have a strong turnout and strong results. Um, I think that there won't be an option. I think people will stand up for that transition. Yeah, and that's that's certainly what I'm hoping too. Um, and and this does bring us to the role of the courts. Uh, in addition to last night's news, where we had the confirmation of uh, one more justice, and if you add her into the mix, um, you know you, we're now in a situation where a majority of the Supreme Court was appointed by presidents that did not win a majority of the vote. So we have two uh, George W. Uh, judges, and then we have three Trump judges, and so that's five of the nine right there. Um, so in response to this, uh, Biden has at times been a little cagey, but has more recently talked about establishing a commission to consider court reform. Um, and so I guess my question to the three of you, whoever would like to take this, is if, if you were on this commission, um, what reforms would you suggest? Are there ways to make our court look more democratic than it does right now? Are there ways um, to make our democracy uh, look more democratic? Because if you, you know, by the way, if you look at the Senate, the 47 senators who caucus with the Democrats represent many more million people than the, the, the majority uh, senators do. So you could also, you could argue that we have a president who, who's in office who was a minority winner. <laughs> We've got a majority of the Supreme Court that was nominated by minority winners. And we have a Senate that is uh, where the majority is representing a minority of the people. Um, so, so what sort of reforms should we be pursuing in these types of, of commissions? Chris, you and I have talked about this in class, I think. So, mm -hmm. I'll, I mean, I'll hand this off to Chris to take this one because he does the judiciary lecture, if I remember <laughs> correctly. Uh, but, you know, but the, it is interesting that the lifetime appointment process was put in place when, when lifespans were much, much shorter. And, and Chris, I think we've shown a graph in, in Political Science 260 before, haven't it, about the length of time that Supreme, I, so I, I can hand it off to you, but that's one, Kim, I think we should consider. Um, I, you know, I would have, I'm an institutionalist at heart, um, you know, pragmatist, I, I really sort of recoil from the initial suggestions of court packing, but I just don't know what to do with this Barrett nomination. I mean, this is really bad. And I don't know if I could stand and, and say, don't pack it at the, or add some seats. You know, mine was like, let's add three seats. So that makes it back to a bare conservative majority still. But boy, that's we're starting down a very problematic road. But Chris, I don't know if you have thoughts on judiciary reform. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do. Uh, it just feels odd talking about this when there's an actual member of Congress in the room with us. So I feel just just go ahead and say this is a crazy professor who I happen to know the neighbor. We happen to have neighbors in common. Um, I think one thing uh, might be to, you know, there's a court packing scenario, which is one that I think a lot of people are gravitating to because it's simple, at least in theory, it's simple. In practice, it would be sort of a tectonic fight, I imagine. Um, it would also consume pretty much all the oxygen of Congress's attention, I'm guessing, in the, in the spring when the Biden administration, should it come to pass, even if it had Democratic Senate, it's going to want to do a bunch of things that are really important, like, for example, save the economy, stop a virus, maybe deal with climate change. But that's one thing. If you're on the commission, you might, you, know, you might consider that as one of your options and keep that as a negotiating strategy. What you might also do, though, is to rethink what the courts are doing, what the Supreme Court does. Um, you know, one, strat one scenario that I've seen, which I, I don't I don't know what the logical extent of it is to basically think of the, the Supreme Court as this entity that basically thinks about, um, you know, whether laws are in conflict with one another. And that's about two thirds of the cases that come in front of the Supreme Court considered sort of statutory conflicts. Um, or whether there's sort of not, you know, whether there's discretion that's given to agencies or not, those kinds of questions that are not related to the constitutional, the Constitution. And then to create an alternative body which does specifically that, deals with the Constitution. That alternative body would take on these kinds of heady, um, these kinds of heady issues, and 
could be structured from the outset of maybe being more representative of the Supreme Court that we currently have. That's one thing you can do. Um, the other thing you could do, of course, is to rethink the, um, the judiciary, not at the Supreme level, but of course, you know, the federal judiciary on down, make it so that there are more cases, sorry, more, more, ju more judges um, there. That's much easier to do. Um, but I think that, you know, the, one of the, the key sort of the, the key challenges here is that the Supreme Court itself often makes more decisions based upon the, the cases it does not hear rather than the cases it does hear. And so it might be useful for us to think about what the role of the court is. And what I'll finally say is that for those of you who have read the Federalist Papers, which I'm guessing is all 152 participants here, um, the Federalist Papers sort of thought about all the issues we're talking about. One of which is a sort of lifetime appointments. Of course, again, it was a long time ago. You'd be lucky to see 30 back then. Um, and the other feature though, is that the, the judges themselves were, you know, was un, it was, they were mostly going to be called upon in order to, to make sense of statutory conflicts, less really about constitutional um, sort of issues. And in fact, that's a power the court literally gave itself. It doesn't necessarily have to have that power. And if we do think that somebody ought to have that power, potentially it ought to be separated from the Supreme Court. Congresswoman, what do you think I, of those I creamy reform. ideas? <laughs> <laughs> little reform. I, so I was going to say, you know, if you look historically, mm -hmm. um, Supreme Court was tied to the circuit courts. And as those got expanded, we had more Supreme Court members. So the number really um, kind of changed a lot over time. Um, and, uh, and even ended up being less than the number of circuit courts um, eventually. Uh, but I do, I think, there are challenges. You change something, somebody else decides to change them again. Um, I think really fundamentally what's going to be very important is that we bring back trust and um, trust in our institutions and trust that the Supreme Court isn't just an ideologically driven uh, group that are where it's predetermined what they're going to decide, um, but they really are a thoughtful body which is really where I think folks um, felt, even in the past, um, you might have struggled to understand or to try to know which president um, appointed which uh, justice. It wasn't always uh, quite so obvious, especially over time. Um, definitely term limits have come up um, to, uh, you know, you see it, in fact a purposeful effort to nominate younger and younger um, folks just so they can be there longer, which doesn't nece isn't necessarily the criteria that you would necessarily want. You want someone who has that great experience and that they're bringing to the table, not just that they're going to be there long, the longest. Um, and so um, I do think that's why I actually think the commission is going to be very important because I do think that it's a much more complicated conversation. And I think the end goal has to be how do we make sure we have a, a court that folks trust and rely upon to make really critically important decisions for our country. Yeah, and we have so many of those really um, huge decisions to make coming up. So that, that makes uh, perfect sense. So uh, as long as we're talking about big things, um, every year we've been having more and more uh, fires and smoke on the West Coast. And you can also see you know, climate change showing up and hurricane damage elsewhere in the country. Um, what are the stakes for climate change in this election? And if the Democrats win, um, what do you think will happen? So let's start with the, the Congresswoman and then and then move to our environmental policy expert, Chris. Yeah. Um, so first I was gonna say, just acknowledging that climate change is an issue is on the ballot right now. I hate to say that. And I was, I as a scientist, as a as starting my, my um, career in science, uh, um, mm -hmm. It's painful to think that we are, folks aren't looking at the basic science, the data, just the reality that we see on the ground. If you talk to farmers or others who've seen changes over time, I don't think uh, it's hard to imagine how um, we continue to see the administration not only deny climate change, but go to the lengths of removing words from documents and changing data. So when we talk about what's on the ballot, clearly this is on the ballot because just acknowledging it, allowing scientists um, to do their work, allowing um, folks to make sure that uh, they're able to publish reports on what's happening as well as come up with ideas of how to address it are critically important. So this is a huge issue, um, unfortunately, because this, you know, issues of, of the environment um, weren't political um, near, or partisan uh, is what I really mean um, the way they are now. So that's been heartbreaking to see, but if we're gonna make the investments we need to, to see change 
if we're going to engage internationally on this issue, because clearly this is a global issue, we've got to have leadership who believes that it's important to do that. So it's absolutely on the ballot. And um, if Democrats win, it will be a priority issue. I think folks are, are have articulated that uh, across the board, but it's unfortunate that we this is not a bipartisan issue because it should be. Yeah, I agree. Chris. Yeah, so uh, uh, Congresswoman Del Bene, you mentioned the sort of the farmers, everybody sort of knows this is happening. My grandpa, of course, used to say that it was a lot colder when he was younger. And we used to think it was full of it. And turns out actually it was. It was a lot colder when he was younger. And John Tester from Montana, where I'm from, uh, just a couple of days ago, was complaining that the first frost was a month late. So this is obviously a, uh, something that we're all uh, interested in. And I think the tide has certainly turned, particularly coming back to that sort of, you know, boomers, as, the, as millennials become the larger of the voting blocks, the millennials have, have grown up with this looming threat for a long time which means that they're really focused on it. Um, so are Xers, by the way, and certainly Generation Z too. So it's something where there's enough momentum and that momentum will manifest itself in votes now in ways that it might not have before. But more specifically with regard to the kinds of public policies we might see, for those of you who've gone through the uh, Biden's energy plan or his environmental justice plan, which I have, um, you, you can see that there's, there's just like a, it's $2 trillion, a lot of stuff. Um, I think, you know, from a path of least resistance perspective, what executives tend to do is to try to find things that are regulatory initially, at least. I mean, certainly that's not always easy, but it's something the executive branch could do easily. I should say easier than trying to get a bill through Congress. Um, so something like, for example, as simple as restoring the methane emissions rule or something a little more complicated, but still something that I think most Americans would be okay with, and that could be increasing corporate average fuel economy standards. I think those are quite possible in the, in the, in the near term. And the, those, those fuel economy standards might be increased such that so much so to increase to um, encourage electric vehicles. But given that we're going to be in a, you know, a relatively poor economy, particularly because Republicans in the Senate are not interested in passing any kind of economic stimulus in the short term, it's likely that any kind of environmental policy that's tied to um, economic stimulus is going to be at least on the, on the docket. This is very reminiscent of the 2008 or 2009, sorry, American uh, uh, of the stimulus package. Recover, recovery and reinvestment act and so i'm thinking about things like tax incentives for new power generation um or uh, tax incentives or, or even or even engaging in different kinds of procurement policies from the federal government the federal government buys about a half a trillion dollars a year with the stuff um it could easily decide it's going to buy a half a trillion dollars a year worth of stuff that's going to assist in the fight against climate change um and a whole it could engage in research and development but one of the things that sort of I think is going to be very challenging for the Congress going forward and uh, is to try to develop a climate bill that doesn't really rely upon the existing uh, laws that we currently have related to environmental protection. As Paul has said, with regard to the Voting Rights Act, that's something that, you know, really should have been probably updated over time. It's not it's not any one member of Congress's fault, but, you know, Congress last time it updated the Voting Rights Act was 2006. Uh, the last time that, you know, the Clean Air Act was updated was really 1990 uh, and the Clean Water Act before then. So. There are these kind of this kind of creaking infrastructure of environmental policy in the United States that we tried to build the clean power plan on top of, and it's fine, it's a good plan, but ultimately, if we're going to address climate change, it's going to have to be through some kind of holistic policy or holistic plan, and that's going to require quite a lot of, of compromise within the Congress, so much so that we have this sort of the looming threats of the fires that Kim mentions, those have to be dealt with relatively quickly, and so it seems as though any packages that are related either to executive authority through regulation or through any kind of stimulative packages associated with the economy are likely to go forward. But finally, what I want us to not forget about is that most of us tend to be focused on issues related to trying to mitigate climate change. That is to sort of stop the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. If you look at traditionally the amount of expenditure that the federal budget has engaged in for programs related to adaptation, that is trying to deal with or live with the effects associated with climate change, which we are going to experience regardless of whether we turn off the carbon dioxide supply tomorrow, that needs to have a much more prominent role in legislation going forward. Those are great thoughts. Um, it, and I have to say on this issue, it, it comes to two things that I really care about a lot too. One, the importance of global cooperation. I mean, the climate change is such a huge global problem as the Congresswoman pointed out. We haven't been very good at working with other countries lately and we need to get a lot better at that because this isn't a problem we can solve by ourselves. But another issue that I really care about is taxes. And here I often think that it would be great to 
put a carbon tax at, into tax legislation as part of a grand bargain, you know, because you can keep rates lower elsewhere because you have all this revenue from the carbon tax. So Republicans could potentially like that feature. Um, but you also are responding seriously to climate change and you're turbocharging absolutely anything you're doing on the regulatory front because now the carbon's priced correctly, right? Solar and wind and, and all the other uh, types of in infrastructure investments you're making are, are more economical. So I, I'd love to see something like that um, myself. I, I wanna turn to this really important issues um, surrounding race and police brutality. And I'm not sure which of us I should really um, address this question to, but, but uh, one thing that you know, seems important is uh, you know, obviously to change the tone in this country and the president has uh, repeatedly uh, resorted to very divisive rhetoric and very racist rhetoric. Um, so I guess it, in some sense, it's obvious that this election is really important for, for addressing issues surrounding race because the, the chief executive is contributing um, to those issues. But more generally, if you look at the issues of police brutality, racial profiling, and the systemic equity inequities that we see as the focus of these protests, a lot of those don't strike me as particularly federal, right? So I guess one question and one way of thinking about this is what is the role of the president? What is the role of Congress? What, and what do we have to leave to state and local governments? And, and if we're leaving things to state and local governments about the police and, and, and those types of issues, are there ways that the federal government and Congress can support state and local governments or can prod them into improving? Um, are there any, is there anything creative here we can suggest so that, to move things forward in this area? Well, we did pass legislation um, at the federal level, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Um, and I say that because um, that, that was the, a, um, a start on the federal side to address issue transparency, accountability, um, ban chokeholds, um, you know, kind of put strong rules in place there, uh, it provide resources for training, uh, national standards for training. Um, so I think the, I think that's a start. I think you're absolutely right. This is not a um, one bill and the issue is addressed. This is, uh, this is a much bigger issue at all levels of government. And frankly, all people, I, um, to you know, quote John Lewis again, um, he said, if you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. Um, we all have an obligation to, to do something about um, systemic racism, about the injustice that we see. And, and we do see people standing up and speaking out, but it's gonna take that, um, and I'm speaking beyond the police brutality side here, but more broadly, um, it's gotta be something that, you know, we all think of as our role to play to really stand up for justice. And, um, and that's uncomfortable for some folks to, to stand up and speak out. Clearly we have um, some folks who have a different opinion, um, but definitely your point that the president has, uh, has made the problem worse, has used hateful rhetoric, has not, not even been willing to be clear, even in a broadcast presidential debate about where he stands on issues of white supremacy, um, that it's a critical time um, when we go back to why your vote matters, but it's also a critical time for our country for, for us to uh, collectively uh, address these issues. And it will be all levels of government, I believe. Yeah, I, I will say this, Kim, it, um, sort of echoes Susan's words. I mean, there are some things that the federal government could stop doing, like sending military surplus to police. That just needs to stop. We don't need that. And the, and that goes back to what happened after 9-11 and we just bought a bunch of new equipment and wore out. We decided we got to just sell it on eBay to police officers around them. Wow, I got a military assault vehicle. That's fun. Um, yeah, I think rhetoric and leadership is an important part of it. But I will say this about Biden on this issue and on many issues. Um, now, I think it, you know, it, it's not going to shock anyone to know that you know, I was a Biden supporter from the start. My extended families from Northeastern Pennsylvania, but it's to know who Biden is. I saw him speak publicly. Um, I think that um, folks who are, uh, feel like they're much more liberal than Biden are very dissatisfied with this choice. Look, keep the pressure up, keep the protests, keep the, here's the thing about Joe Biden. He's, he, he will do what the party wants. And if the party wants 
police reform, Biden will be behind it. Folks hold him accountable for the 94 uh, uh, crime bill, but I remember what it was like in 94. And that, that was a bipartisan support for that. So Biden was with everyone on that. There were not many people who were opposed to that bill at that time. Um, so look, if, if we keep the pressure, if, if Democrats and others keep the pressure on Biden on a variety of issues, on tax reform, on criminal justice reform, on racial justice, I am convinced that Biden um, will be behind those issues because that's who he is. He, he's going to see himself as the leader of the party. So I think we're going to make great progress on that, Kim. I think we're going to have a lot of positive rhetoric. And if just you've heard him speak, Chris knows this, you know, I've met him personally boy, when you meet him personally, you really see the difference. The, the empathy, the warmth, um, the understanding of loss. I mean, that's, I think, empathy. That's really what we need. And I think that's going to speak to Black Americans who've suffered these injustices. And I think Biden could provide some of that leadership that we have sadly not seen. What we've had is fanning the flames of, of distrust and hate. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I have to say that it's even though it's the vice presidency isn't, you know, as big a role as the presidency. It, it would be quite a historic thing to have both a woman and a person of color um, serve as vice president. And, and Kamala Harris has been doing an amazing job on this issue and on, on a thousand other issues during the campaign. So um, I'm really happy to see her out there myself. Again, speaking for myself. Um, <laughs> All right, well, so Kim, I mentioned yeah. that because folks said, what do we do yeah. after the election? Do yeah. we close up shop? No, you keep pushing. Keep this agenda moving. Well, what, uh, Biden so wins, keep it going. To that point, to that point, uh, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez was interviewed a couple of days ago, and what she said is that, you know, asked the question about whether young voters are going to be choosing Biden, should they feel bad about that or whatever. And, and, and she said, listen, young voters, millennials, are choosing who they want to lobby. And so they understand that somebody like Biden can be motivated. And I think that's sort of the telling, sort of builds upon your point, Paul. Young voters, lots of us are, understand that this candidate, because this candidate hasn't had to like, you know, engage in a battle of ideas with the president because the president has not offered that many ideas. Because of that, the candidate has a lot of flexibility with regard to what he can do in office. And he seems to also have a blank check. And so therefore it seems like it's somebody who could be motivated by the party as well as by people who are outside the party too. Can I add that, um... And, and some of you have brought up the, you know, about Congress passing policy, keeping things up to date. Um, um, we also have to pass policy to keep things up to date. Um, and um, that's hard. The, yeah. the, if you win the Senate, you're going to win in states that are definitely more moderate. Um, purple states, I say, um, because that's how you get the majority. Um, and we may grow the House majority as well, and that may grow because of folks um, in purple districts. So um, what policy looks like in the end uh, to address these issues, I think people share values and what they wanna accomplish, but the details of exactly what that policy looks like, that's gonna be a effort where a lot of people are gonna be involved. Um, it can't just be someone saying it's my way or the highway. And I think that's important that people understand that is the legislative process and when it's worked, um, and both of you know better than I, um, when it's worked, it's been because people sat at the table and worked through those issues and built coalitions. It's not because someone said, here's, here's an idea and it's the only idea. Um, and so I think that is gonna be the incredible opportunity. Um, and I remind folks that um, I think that would be a, a great challenge to have um, depending on the election, um, but it's also a responsibility and that will, that. And, and it will require a lot of work because we it'll be important for things to actually get done across the finish line uh, more than just rhetoric. Yeah, and it's also important that Democrats can work together amongst themselves too, because the party really covers quite a spectrum of views at this point on a lot of these issues, right? So uh, it would be terrific to get the average of those views done rather than turn into two camps that were fighting with each other and got nothing done. So. Uh, that's important to keep in mind. Um, so one final really big issue here, uh, the virus and the economy, and I'm going to make them kind of into one issue here a little bit, because I do think they are in part one issue. One thing that you see 
in the news a lot is this fake trade-off where it's like if we we've got to you know play it fast and loose with the virus because the economy is really important um, but if you look at the cross-country data it's really clear that the countries that have the virus under control are also seeing um, much better economic statistics right um, so in January, assuming that we can't get a lot done during the, the lame duck session, right, um, Congress is going to have to turn to both stimulus to address, you know, the, the economy, but also to really serious uh, measures to get this virus under control. So um, Congresswoman, do you have forecasts there? Um, what kind of stimulus measures and, and virus response can we expect from Congress? And assuming the trifecta scenario where, all, where uh, the President Biden will get to work with the Democratic Senate and the House. Um, well, first I'd say um, the, there's gonna be an ongoing push in the lame duck session to get a relief bill through. Um, it's critically important every day. It's, I mean, I've talked to so many of my constituents and I know it's true across the country who mm -hmm. literally needed resources yesterday, weeks ago. Um, it's really unconscionable that that still hasn't happened yet. So that will continue to be something important, even if it's something that is put in place that gets us to January where there can be a more comprehensive response, but um, it's terrible that we're not there yet. And my hope is that there would be something um, that would come up even in the short term. Now, that being said, I also think that um, the, crushing the virus is critically important. That's gonna mean making sure that we have those investments in public health, in, um, in the, um, ongoing work to uh, come up with a vaccine, the preparation and supply chain work to make sure that there's availability and there are plans. Um, trust in institutions, as we've talked about before, will be critically important that people understand that science is going to lead when we look at something like a vaccine, um, because that's also been, there's been mistrust sowed even in um, just the basic idea of whether a vaccine that was improved would really be approved for the right reasons. So I think there's gonna be work, work to do um, there as well. But I'd say there's relief. So you're talking about relief and recovery. The question is where will we be in January? Is it relief focused? You can do things that are stimulative, but are people able to do that work? Are you able to open up um, so I think that's something we have to balance. Clearly infrastructure is a place where I think um, there should be bipartisan agreement and, um, and there should be an a opportunity to, um, to invest there and help um, kind of build, build the infrastructure of the future, not just yesterday's infrastructure. So my hope is that um, if we can get more looking towards recovery and I, lay that out very clearly because you can't, if folks can't go to work in certain areas or there's not safe, it's not safe, um, just putting financial incentives in place that are in, in um, conflict with the public health response would be hard. So I think we're gonna have to look at both of those um, and do what we can to help folks get through and also be prepared for, um, for more stimulus as things are able to open. And I just don't know what the timing would be on that. Yeah. Yeah, one proposal that I, I like that got added to the Biden plan was making the child tax credit refundable, um, because one of the interesting things about the child tax credit is it doesn't actually reach <laughs> some of the, or a big chunk of it doesn't reach those at the, at the very bottom because it's not fully refundable. Um, and so that making that larger and fully refundable can be a way to sort of make families, you know. Well, separate. thanks for bringing that up because that's, uh, I'm, I'm uh, one of the folks who's been uh, leading that effort. And um, yeah. I think people forget that tax credits um, are making them refundable actually means you could have a payment every month as opposed to something you just figure out at the end of the year. But yeah, 4 million children would be lifted out of poverty if we pass um, legislation like the American Family Act um, that we put forward or and pieces of it have been included in a relief package if we can get it through. But um, yeah, I think that's not only short-term policy, I think that's really great long-term policy. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And it seems like one of the big tools that we have to make a more inclusive economy is to massively expand both that credit and the earned income tax credit, right? To make the, to sort of help the tax system, um, you know, 
buffer us from all these forces that increase income inequality instead of exacerbate the income inequality like we've seen lately with the tax cuts and jobs. There's three. We also include the child independent <laughs> care tax credit. So the child tax oh, yeah. credit, the earned income tax credit, and the child independent care tax credit are kind of the three together that um, can hit kind of all the different um, different areas but are also incredibly complementary. Yeah, and really good for the economy too, because the dependent care tax credit can also dramatically help with labor force participation and economic growth and grow the pie so that there's more, you know, for all of these big priorities. Okay, well, it looks like we only have about two minutes left. So maybe a final question could be, what should we look for in the early um, results as they roll in a week from today? As they roll in literally a week from right now, we will be looking at the five o'clock poll closings or eight o'clock on the East Coast. So what, what should we look for at eight o'clock on the East Coast in a week? Florida. Look, I, I, I wanna chime in on one thing, Kim, that both you and Susan sure. said. To me, mm -hmm. many of these things we've been talking about over the last hour and many of the problems that I suspect many of the folks watching concerned with have, have their roots in income inequality, 25 mm -hmm. or 30 years of increasing income inequality, which has also meant wealth concentration and that wealth concentration has been deployed to build up a Supreme Court, to build a rhetoric about climate change being fake, about, I mean, about voter fraud. These have been very focused efforts from very wealthy individuals. What I find very disheartening when I see some of the friends on Chris's Facebook feed is this is not, it's percolated down to the mass public. You see folks on Chris's Facebook feed who are working class stiffs in Montana and believe this rhetoric that they're hearing that's basically coming from a, you know, a literally 10 wealthy families in the United States who are funding this. So Kim, your work has been apt and don't miss folks what Kim said. These policies are not, these, these tax policies are gonna result in less income inequality, more economic growth, which is gonna allow us to address. And that's, what, so what do we look to Florida? You know, Florida is gonna be number one, I'll say that. Uh, and if Florida is too close to call or leaning Biden, you guys can go to sleep early. It's gonna be a long night for the GOP. Next up for me is gonna be Pennsylvania. The worry in Pennsylvania is the laws are such that right now they can't begin to count their absentee ballots until election day. So if it's too close to call then uh, President Trump has a lead because the election day ballots um, in Pennsylvania and all the pile up of absentee ballots from Democrats start to get counted. Lawyers are gonna be climbing into their Learjets or their Greyhound buses or whatever they do in a pandemic and driving to Harrisburg and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and it's going to be a long and, and pretty hard post-election season. Chris, anything yeah, else? Yeah, I mean, obviously Florida Florida is the key, unfortunately for all of us in America. I'm kidding, for those of you who are Floridians, but Florida seems to be the key to this presidential election uh, in terms of, if for, if this year we thought we could get away from it, but the fact that Florida is going to count all of its ballots by the end of the night, well, that unfortunately makes it important. The same thing goes, though, for Texas, which will count quite a few of its ballots. And even though I'm not sure that, you know, I, it's definitely a fever dream that Democrats have in order to win Texas, I think the margin there is going to be important. So if it's really close in Texas, yep. then, then, it's, uh, then it's, I mean, it's a long night for the GOP. So even if Florida, if, if it's kind of close in Florida, if it's close in Texas, it's close in Georgia, I mean, that's, that's kind of game. Yeah, over. I tell this story in 92 when I was doing a student event when I was teaching at Duke. In 92, folks might remember Dan Quayle was vice presidential candidate. Indiana results came in. It was early. It was too close to call. And I said, folks, that's and the, the Republican leaning students were so angry. I said, look, Quayle's from Indiana. It's a conservative state. If Indiana is too close to call, game over. Yeah. But Montana, how about Montana? Yeah. How's Bullock going to do? I said, well, Bullock said plus one. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, he's in the margin of error. Sorry, that's I know, like, the key Montana. state, Montana. Montana is my my home state. Plus two for Trump right now, which is amazing. All right, Congresswoman, any last thoughts to close this out? No, I'm also going to be looking at all those members of Congress who are running um, across the country, um, the House and the Senate. There's obviously a ton of races. See, um, but clearly, uh, some of those will be indicative too of what's happening at the at the national level, the presidential election. Um, but um and how about the seahawks are they gonna go all the way <laughs> um well you know last last sunday was not our our best game so um so uh we'll hope for better better this weekend but um most important um is is what happens on tuesday so um if you haven't voted yet anybody out vote. there make sure you vote
Yeah, absolutely. Everybody vote. And, and thank you so much for coming to the attendees. And, and thank you so much, Congresswoman, for joining us. And of course, thanks to Chris and Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Take care. Stay healthy. You too. Goodbye, everybody.